for or anything else. It played at the box office for over a year. Now, if you don't go see a movie within three weeks, it's gone. You wait for video or pay-per-view or whatever. But in 1977, we anticipated the arrival of this movie that changed the United States, probably the world as we know it. You recognize the song, you recognize the series. But see, we're not here to talk about things like that today. We're here to talk about the advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who did come 2,000 years ago, and who will, who will come again and make everything right, everything perfect, everything true. And to those who know and believe in His name, we have the utmost hope in our lives. Hope that we're supposed to share with the world so that not one will be lost. That's the calling of a Christian, to be like Christ, to proclaim His gospel message, to tell people of the hope that's within us. I've got some scripture readings that I would like for us to ponder on this morning. Jacob, if you'll take the microphone to whoever has Hebrews 9, verses 24 to 28. Jacob. Sure. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of a true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offend himself again, to offer himself again and again. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared only once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people were destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Who has 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? For those where we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have, not, who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter three ten through thirteen. But the Lord, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth, and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and the speed is its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Let's see, Matthew 24. <laughs> I didn't plan it that way. <laughs> Matthew 24, 36 through 42. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, 
nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what was, would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. We have another one. Star Wars, 1977, if you don't know it, had a subtitle. It was called The New Hope. That's what we're celebrating today is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We're going to be lighting this hope candle. And as we enter into the Advent season, we'll be lighting other candles as well. Hope, love, joy, and peace are the things that we're going to look at each, each week, the four Sundays prior to Christmas, so that we can remember what Jesus Christ did for us at His first coming. Advent, if you don't know it, means arrival, an arrival of a, not a notable person, something that's highly anticipated and expected. But see, the first time that Jesus came, it was anticipated, but He came at a dark time when there was no hope left. But God is faithful. He sent His Son just as he said, and it was his perfect plan that even with the rejection of his own people with the nation of Israel, that salvation would be offered to everyone. And Jesus Christ will return again. So as we light these candles, as we celebrate, we're remembering what Jesus did, and we're also looking forward to his return. But in the meantime, it's kind of like this pencil. I didn't know this pencil that I grabbed it this morning. It says... Life without Jesus is like this pencil. No point. <laughs> this one has a point, though it's sharp. That's why I grabbed it. But we are supposed to be living our life in expectation, joyful expectation, hopeful expectation that Jesus Christ will return and that it's our duty, our responsibility, our privilege to raise our children up, to tell our friends and neighbors, to live a life, a life that we see through the Old Testament that we can't live on our own, but God gave us His Spirit to dwell inside of us. Things that the Old Testament saints never got to experience unless God's Spirit came upon them. And whenever God's Spirit came upon them, they started speaking from God, telling the hope that they have for one another. So we've got one more verse. It's Revelation 22, 12 through 14. And Marianne, come up here. Yeah. I picked you for this one because I'm watching this hope in you grow. And it's so exciting. So if you will read the verse and then light this candle right here, we'll light the hope candle. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. If you'll light that one right there. It's new. Bear with it. Thank you, Marianne. The candles are, are put in a circular position, if you can't tell this from here. Generally, they're put in a wreath. This is a, is a porcelain or a ceramic one. And that wreath is a circle. A circle is never ending. That, that signifies that hope and that trust that we have in God, that He will complete His promises. That we know without a doubt that Jesus Christ will return so that we can celebrate these things. And we'll light each candle. The, the candles, again, are hope, love, joy, and peace until we light the center candle on Christmas Eve. We'll have a Christmas Eve service at 6 p.m., a candlelight service. And we'll light the Christ candle then, showing that we believe 
that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He died for our sins, that if we believe in Him and follow in His steps, that we will have eternal life. And notice I put in following His steps. I'm going with James. I'm not saying we have to have works of righteousness. The Bible's clear about that. But if we do believe, we will do things that show, prove, test our faith. So the first candle we lit, Mary Ann lit for us, is hope. That hopeful expectation that we have. Not hope as mankind has, because I don't just hope something happens tomorrow. I know that that time will come. I know without a doubt. It'll be like the days of Noah when people are eating and drinking and have no idea. It'll come as a thief in the night, the verses that we read. But it will come. And Jesus will come to bring judgment and reward, depending on whether you're on His side, if you believe in Him and have decided with His party, with His philosophy, the fact that He gave up His life to save you and called you to be fishers of men, or whether you didn't believe. He will separate the sheep from the goats. doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you believe, and whether you know Jesus Christ or not. Jesus Christ is the light of the world and He calls us to be the light of the world. His hands and feet to offer salvation to others until that time comes. So what did Jesus teach? What did He teach to His followers? Well, we'll look quickly at Matthew and see if you can get a, get a theme here. In Matthew 4.19, Jesus said, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Moving on to Matthew 8, verses 21 and 22, another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Next chapter, Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Next chapter, in chapter 10, Matthew 10, 38. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In Matthew 16, then Jesus said to his disciples, verse 24, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. In Matthew 19, 21, Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give them to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then... Come and follow me. And later in that same chapter, Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. If you didn't notice the pattern there that I'm trying to, to get you to see through Jesus' own words, is follow me. You can't follow Jesus unless you believe in Jesus. You can't follow Jesus unless you put the other things aside off the throne first and let Him be on the throne. And that includes ourselves. That's the thing that's so hard to take off the throne. To realize that He's in control of all things. We're not in control of anything. And everything that we have comes from His grace upon grace upon grace. Follow Jesus. Do you believe this? Jacob last week mentioned the great commandment. Matthew says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Jacob misquoted that, just so you know. He didn't say mind. And that's okay. It's not to point him out that he misquoted it. Jesus intentionally misquoted Deuteronomy when he said that. Because see, in that time, it was the time of the enlightenment of men. And our minds tell us that we don't have to repent and follow after Jesus. That we can take and pick and choose what we want to out of this. It's still okay. That we can have salvation through different ways. Whatever it is. But if my mind tells me this, then that's a lie from Satan. God's Word is clear. There is no other name under heaven given to, among men, given to men whereby you might be saved. And all who believe in Him will be saved. So come and follow after Him. Show your faith by your works. Keeping works of repentance, fruit of repentance. 
to know that your faith is genuine. Telling others about the joy that you have so that you can be the light to this world, so that your good deeds will glorify your Father in heaven and draw all men unto Him. So Jesus intentionally said, you got to get this mind thing taken care of so I can take care of this heart problem that you have. Until you change your mind, you're not going to be able to do what Deuteronomy 6, 5 says. It says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Jesus intentionally said mind because you're never going to love Him with all the strength that you have till you change that way of thinking. What a foolish thing that the Son of God would come to this earth, give up heaven, and die on a cross to save me and you. Because He loved you. Because He was obedient to the Father. Because He didn't care about giving up heaven if it meant that He could save you. That's what believing in Jesus Christ means. And that's why Jesus misquoted, don't take that word out of context, it's the word I have in my mind, but why He intentionally said Deuteronomy 6 in a little different way. So that you could wrap your mind around this incredible foolishness, as Paul says, of the cross. But it is the power unto salvation. Matthew 22, verse 35 to 40, read this way. One of them, an expert in the law. So he knew, he knew that Jesus wasn't even quoting this correctly, but he didn't say a word about it because he saw the authority and power that Jesus had. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. I don't know what that expert was thinking at that time. I don't know. He's like, oh, I've caught him. But then he was silenced by Jesus' words. He says, This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. If you notice, he's quoting the Ten Commandments. There are also the first four commandments about your relationship with God so that you can do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten with your relationship with one another. You can work from the beginning. If you put God on His throne, you can work through the commandments and you can live those commandments. Not by your power, but by the power of the Spirit. If you start with the covet when you've got the covet taken care of because you've died to yourself through the power of the Spirit, then you'll notice you can work your way back to God who provided for you in the first place. Because it is God who brought you life. It is God who saved your life through, through Jesus. And God through the power of His Spirit, which will help you to leave holy, sanctified, set-apart lives, which is your reasonable act of service. So are you religious like this expert? Or do you love Jesus? Which one? Because all the religion in the world is not going to save you, but Jesus Christ died to save you. Many who call themselves Christians do not love Jesus with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their mind, all of their strength. Because they haven't got this mind thing figured out yet, they rationalize why they can give Him less than all. But Scripture's clear, you give Him all because He's God. He deserves your worship, his, your adoration. And on top of that, He gave His Son to redeem you. What more can you give to Him? Can you afford to give Him less than all? Or are you dying to give Him everything that you have because your mind knows what Christ did for you so that you can love Him with all of your strength? Every part of your being, the life that He gave you, the abilities that He gave you, to worship and praise Him. Jacob talked about the preeminence of Jesus Christ also. Jesus Christ, the anointed Holy One, the only Son of God who came to die to take away the sins of mankind. The people of that day didn't understand it. You don't have to understand everything now. But Jesus Christ came to die so that you would follow after Him 
Become fishers of men. Draw people to God because of the love that He had for you that you will give your life in return for Him. The advent of Jesus Christ, that expected coming, He did come. It's a fact. There is an empty tomb that proves it, which is different than any other religion. <laughs> we serve a risen Savior. So we can have hope that we will have eternal life. The preeminence, the fact of surpassing all others. That's who Jesus Christ is. Because He is God and gave up Godhead to save you. And He deserves all of your worship. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you remember that's the Hall of Faith chapter, at the end of that chapter in verse 39, it reads this way, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 39, what is the thing that was promised that was not received by the ancients? Jesus' first coming. All of the hope that they had, their faith, was that God would send a Savior. And that's exactly what happened roughly 2,000 years ago. They thought He was going to rule on the King of David then. They didn't know their Savior was going to come and die for them so that they could carry on His mission, His beliefs, His teaching, His commands, whatever you want to call them. They didn't understand that at all. But because of that, verse two, or the next verse, verse 40 says, Since God had planned something better for us, and so that only together with us, because of their rejection, salvation was offered to all men. So that through our part in this, the church age, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, Christians who are like Christ, that we can carry on the work to make perfect that plan, to make perfect the faith of the Old Testament saints with the New Testament saints. Verse 1, Therefore, because of that, because of His first advent, because of all the promises of the Old Testament, because of the fact we can't keep the law, but Jesus Christ did die spotless and blameless for our sins. And we have all of these witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And after we've done that, we run the race set before us with perseverance with hope, with power from on high to live that life, waiting for the second advent of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Verse 2 says to fix our eyes steadfast, where they don't move, they don't waver, so that we're focused on what He accomplished, knowing that any lie that Satan throws out there, that Jesus Christ defeated Him defeated sin, defeated death, gave us power to live. He did it all when He died on that cross and rose again. There is no doubts, no room for Satan to put those lies into your life. He doesn't have any dominion. Scripture tells you to tell Him to flee from you. Fix your eyes on Jesus and Jesus will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. The hope that we have of a, a glorious future in heaven for all eternity. The joy that we have, that we can rejoice and tell one another, and suffer with one another, knowing that no matter what suffering comes, it's worth it. Because Jesus endured the cross for us. He considered His, his joy. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Then verse 3, Consider Him, consider Jesus. That's what we're doing today in these services leading up to Christmas. Consider Jesus, 
who endured such opposition from sinners, his enemies. Huh? Helps me every time I think about that to love my enemies. To know that, that Jesus has called me to suffer so that I can proclaim Him. So that suffering doesn't seem so hard after that. And it's nothing compared to what my Savior did for me. Nothing that I will ever suffer has even a comparison to that. And why do I do this? Why do I consider Him? So that I will not grow weary and lose heart or soul, or strength, or mind, but it will all be fixed on Jesus. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, and this is one of my theme set of verses, you hear me, hear me saying it time and time again, therefore, since all of the things that Paul has said prior to this, I urge you brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, that's summing up what he said, God didn't have to have mercy on you. And mercy, again, is giving you the opposite of what you deserve. The wages, what we deserve for our works, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In view of God's mercies, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember, Jesus quoted it, mind first before we can do our strength. By the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The end of verse 1 in the New International Version says, this is our true and proper worship. I want to give you just some other translations so it will give you a little different thought of what this verse is saying. King James Version says, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable. Think about your mind again. here. It's reasonable to do that. It makes sense. It's proper. Okay? It's worship. Giving adoration to God. English Standard Version says, which is your spiritual worship. Jesus says that it's the time has come to worship Him in spirit and truth. We cannot see God cannot go to heaven unless we're born again by the Spirit. We are spiritual beings with a human casing. Our spirit is what we'll live on. We will be giving new bodies. This is a tent now, Paul says. So why are we worried about this? Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. The Darby Bible translation says, which is your intelligent service. It's unintelligent not to think of giving up your entire body as a living sacrifice as proper worship. It's unintelligent to think of something different. New American Standard Bible says, which is your spiritual service of worship. Christian Standard Bible says, this is true worship. Good News Translation says, this is true worship that you should offer. New Living Translation says, this is truly the way to worship Him. And the Contemporary English Version says, that's the most sensible way to serve God. <laughs> this makes sense. Contemporary English. You know, you may not think it's as eloquent or anything, but this is the way to serve God. There's no other way but to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, to wrap your minds around the preeminence of Christ, the one that surpasses all others, so that you can understand Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. If you don't know what that chapter is, go home and read it again. Read it, read it, read it, because it's the law set before telling us to train up our children, to see its importance, to write it on the doorpost, to talk about it when we get up, to talk about it when we sit down, to talk about it when we go to bed, because we want our children grounded in faith. That faith which came to life in flesh and blood when Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago. That flesh that was nailed upon the tree and bled out and died for me so that I could live for Him. Not part of me, but all of me. With all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. That first candle is hope. And I said before we started at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, I want to go to the beginning of Hebrews chapter 11 now because this is the hall of faith, the hope that we have. All these Old Testament saints that we see these examples. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we 
hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That we don't ever have to lose hope. That we don't ever have to doubt. Verse 2 says, This is what the ancients were commended for. Salvation hasn't changed. It's from faith. Hope that we have that Jesus Christ would come, which is a fact now, and that Jesus Christ will return again, which is a fact that hasn't happened yet, but it's a fact. God is beyond time and space. We just can't see that yet because we are temporal creatures. But God's word is truth. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life where we get our hope. And verse 6 of Hebrews 11 says, And without faith it is is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe, yes, that He exists. And we've got something tied to this here. We believe, and because we believe, we know that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Show me your faith without your works. James calls it dead, lifeless, useless, worthless. Not saving faith at all. Even the demons believe and shudder. They fear and tremble. We should believe and live by the power of God, His Holy Spirit. That is hope. That we have faith to believe in Jesus Christ and faith to live out that life. All of it as a living sacrifice. doesn't matter what you claim to believe. It matters what you believe and your life will show it or not. And Jesus will come to reward those who earnestly and diligently seek and follow after Him. I want to read from Luke chapter 1. And we're going to read some more in the upcoming weeks from Luke 1. I'm going to read the first 25 verses. This is Luke's orderly account of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, His life, what He came for. And Luke chapter 1 starts with introducing the birth of Christ. Verse 1 says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. With this in mind, mind, See the point here with our mind so that we can focus on serving with everything else we have? With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis, so that you may know with certainty of the things that you have been taught. And from Hebrews 11, the things that are to come with certainty. Verse 5, in, this, in, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, I don't want to get into this text deeply because there's so much here, but... Sounds kind of like Abraham and Sarah, doesn't it? And Abraham was commended in Hebrews chapter 11 for his faith. But we still waver in our faith. Don't ever feel ashamed or let down for that. Get up, fix your eyes on Jesus. He couldn't see how God would give him the promise as old as he was and Sarah being unfertile. So he took things into his own hand. But still we have him as a father of our faith. And here Zechariah doesn't believe. We go on to read what the angel says and we see the, the penalty there is he's, he's made uh, mute, made, it, made able to, unable to speak because of his disbelief. Jesus also said, Woe to you cities who did not see the miracles I would have performed here had you not had the faith. God wants to perform so many miracles in your life, through you, in your family, if you believe and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Verse 6, Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So here's this lack of hope. 
Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then, when all hope seemed to be gone, you can't use me, I'm too old, whatever, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Don't miss those opportunities. Standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Now, we don't know what that prayer is. Might have been for a child still. He might have lost that hope. Might have been the past culmination of prayers. But here's what Gabriel goes on to say. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. When all hope is gone, God is full of hope and will give it to you. And you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. For he is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their parents back to their children. What I tell you Deuteronomy 6 was about earlier? About training up your children. If your mind thinks that you can live a life of half-hearted obedience, what are you teaching your children? To be half-hearted obedient? To be even less than that because they don't see your faith lived out? And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you the good news, the gospel message. This thing that we can count all of our hope in, that we can rejoice in, that we can tell others about. This good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day that this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. We can believe every word. Verse 21, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. <laughs> Seize every opportunity you have to proclaim Jesus Christ, because there will come a time when you will not be able to. Tell of the joy you have today. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, in these days when all hope was gone, when it was too, too old, I'd given up. God has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Because that's what God does. He gives glory and honor to those who follow Him. We will receive the inheritance that Jesus received. Eternal life in heaven. And He will come again to reward those who diligently seek Him. This is the day we lit the hope candle. Do you have hope in Jesus? Christmas is a time of giving, time we celebrate. If you wonder what the little sticky note sticky was in your bulletin, if you didn't get a bulletin today, it would have been a good day to get a bulletin. <laughs> I have more stickies if you need to. I want you to think about the hope that you have and write down something that you have not given to God in the past that you know He's wanted to take from you or you know He's wanted you to be obedient about and give it to Him this Christmas. That you know that there's hope. That maybe whatever this thing is you thought you had lost all hope in that your child would come to salva salvation through Jesus Christ. That this cancer would be beat. That I couldn't make amends with this person just because he got under my skin so much. Whatever it is. 
Jesus has called you to be a living hope. So I ask you to think about that and write it down, and I ask you to place it in this little bag up here. Because this is a little <laughs> bag with hearts on it, because of the love of God. And this will be sitting here under the tree. You don't have to share it with anybody. I can close it up if you're worried about that, whatever. But let's put it there and let's think about what God has done for us. You can do it at any time. You don't have to do it today, but that's what the sticky note was for. And if you need another one, I'll give you one. What have you been keeping from Him? Jesus gave it all for you. He didn't hold anything back. At any point in time, He could have called a legion of angels down, anything else. He even said before he went in the garden, he said, Father, if you will take this from me, take it. But he said, not my will, but thine. And he has called us to be a living hope, his hands and feet in this world. That's what believing in Jesus Christ is. Luke 24, 21 to 26 reads this way, but we had hoped that He was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find His body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said He was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are. How slow to believe. <laughs> they had lost hope. Jesus is the hope. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter His glory? And won't He return again to take you home? Where is Jesus now? He's in heaven, interceding with the Father, preparing a place for you. And He will return again to take you with Him. John 14, 1 through 4 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going back there and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with Me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place that I'm going. Father in heaven, we thank you that your word is truth, that you loved us enough to send Jesus to die for our sins. Oh, Father, take from us any of the doubts, any of the insecurities, any of the sins that we're unwilling to give you. Take them all. We can't do it on our own, and we know that's why you gave us your spirit, to seal us and to empower us to live a life. Sanctify us through your word through Jesus becoming more and more real in our lives. Clear our minds of any insecurities and thoughts. Drive Satan from this place. He has no dominion here whatsoever. Lord, bring realization of the victory in our lives that Jesus Christ won for us at the cross by increasing our faith. We thank you for the hope that we have that we know with complete confidence that Jesus Christ will return and take us home. We thank you and praise you for all the blessings that you've given to us. Help us to be a light to our families, to our friends, to offer hope to a world who truly needs to see the hope that you can give them. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.